thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to talk here about the topic of identity and access management. It's quite a strange topic for most of the people because it's so narrow and deep. So it's not the wide topic who everybody has touch points to. And so I will try to explain some of the concepts around the topic and as well uh, why we built a cloud native solution and why we think that is something different than the things that already exist in the market. And also, uh, we will see what's the handicap of the existing solutions as well. So if you have any questions at any time, feel free to, to ask them, either by unmuting yourself or writing them to the chat. As we are not many people, I'm quite flexible in regard to giving you guys answers, because uh, it, it may be a little more interactive at that point, and I would absolutely love that. So let's kick things off. So the agenda we have today is more or less like this. So why we built the cloud native uh, open source identity and access management solution. And I will go through those four major topics. So for starters, who is we? Uh, because you need to have some context because we are, we are a new company or young company with two years of age. So it's, I, I will explain a little bit about that. Then why we did start the project as it is right now. What, what it makes special and also what else can it do for you. So it's kind of the, the last bullet point is more or less yeah, yeah, the features that are lying around, but it's not the message I want to get to you guys today. So let's kick it off. Who is we? Yeah, by we, we talk of chaos. The company or the legal entity itself is called chaos. And the product we have is Citadel. So Citadel is the uh, cloud native EIM. I'm going to talk about it. But just to give you a sense of what we what is, uh, we are 11 people, uh, all specialized in the identity and access management field, and as well with GitOps, because yeah, we run Citadel as cloud service as well. So we need to have some GitOps people to really and efficiently run uh, Citadel. And you will see why I'm talking about GitOps there and not DevOps, because we think GitOps is the right way to do things around the security solution. And we are an open source company. So actually, most of the work we do is licensed with an Apache 2 license, but not everything we do. So because there, there are some nifty parts we don't think we need to publish them like the, the billing module for our solution and stuff because that would make would make it too easy for other people to use our product and run their own cloud service with it. So it's kind of there are some small details we, we are not including in the open source solution. We are a member of the Swiss uh, made software um, uh, um, uh, what's it called in English? Uh, 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 as of a Rhein, uh, let's uh, let's say it in German for now, and also on the CH Open, and <clears throat> we sponsor the Open ID Foundation, which is kind of a standardizing body for the, um, the identity protocols. For example, um, if you ever heard of Open ID Connect, uh, which is an authentication standard that's originated that originated in the open id foundation so we're working with the standardizing body because it's quite important to know all the my all the minor nifty details if you want to implement it correctly also one thing that's not mentioned here we, we're working with the ech like the standardizing body for identity and access management in switzerland as well that's uh, from the public sector and we're working there as well uh, to to make sure that our solution does also conform to the uh, ego to the government sector for Switzerland as well. So let's proceed. As said, we are eleven people. Most of them, or you will see, most of our headcount is actually business oriented and development oriented. So, like the technical part is around seventy percent. And the, the business part is steadily growing right now because yeah, yeah, we need to be better at the business part as company because the technical part is really well established and we have a great head counter. What's special about this at our company is that most of the people have shares of the company. So it's more or less partner controlled until now. And so we have quite a, a lot of flexibility in regard to what we do and what we want to achieve with it. So we have no external companies 
influencing our decisions too much. So, but that's just the flexibility in the work. So what do we do? We actually built Citadel. That's the thing I'm going to talk about it today. And we build Orbos as well. Orbos is kind of an enabler for us to run Citadel wherever we like. You can think of it like a, a small time OpenShift solution optimized for GitOps because it enables us to run Citadel uh, on all the uh, infrastructure providers we would like to choose. So, so we have automations done for Google and also automations done for CloudScale. Well, CloudScale is a smaller provider in Switzerland. They have a great API for uh, infrastructure as a service use cases so that we can run a full-blown cl Citadel cluster within minutes with them by provisioning all the necessary tools like the VMs, like the Kubernetes and uh, all the platform components, Grafana and Loki and all that stuff. So it's kind of the, the enabler to run Citadel easily. I'm coming back to that because it's kind of a big thing that you can run the solution easily, even in the times of Kubernetes, there are some kinks and flaws to that. We run Citadel CH, which is actually the cloud solution of us. So it's you can figure the open source project is called Citadel. And then we have the cloud solution, which is powered by Citadel, which is called Citadel CH. That's the domain to it. And uh, that's actually an EIM as a service out of Europe, mostly hosted in Switzerland. And we, have, we even provide a free tier for developers and stuff. So yeah, if you need at any any time an OAuth or OpenID Connect solution, yeah, go ahead and make your organization. Feel free to use the system. It's, it's quite easy to get started, and yeah, it's kind of an off zero alternative at that point. We, we also provide yeah support for our clients, but that's time and material basis is not really the thing we are aiming for. And we also do engineering in the IAM and the DevOps part, but that's the smaller part of the company. That's just to make sure that our customers get up to speed in the projects. Oh, why did we actually start the project? Because that's kind of the questions we hear often. Because yeah, there are a lot of alternatives in regard to identity and access management. So we have Keycloak, we have Glue, we have, um, yeah, you, you even get the, the, the classic Swiss brands like Ergon, you get Navis, you get um, uh, IT Sense, and all the, all of those are actually in the market. So and I'm going to dive in why we didn't choose to, to use such a system in a past project. And that's the reason we started our journey with Citadel. So in 2019, that's where we actually started with the, the, the idea and vision of becoming an identity and access management system. And the, the kicker was that we already built and operated an identity and access management system for, a, let's say, let's call it XAS provider in the public sector. So they, they offer infrastructure and as well software to government bodies. And we saw a lot of deficiencies of existing solutions there. So you have kind of a tricky part because you have uh, like 20 customers all with different identity provider scenarios. And you need to make sure that the identity system is one system where you can share things between customers because you don't want to duplicate uh, data. And oftentimes existing solutions had problems with exactly that. So if you think of a key cloak, for example, you have your realms and their realms are really greatly separated, but you can't really share data between the realms, which is oftentimes necessary because you as service provider might uh, create a service which you want to give to customer A and customer B. Yeah, so they, you have kind of a relation and I have a diagram for that exact purpose later on, because that's one of the big deficiencies the existing system has. So the, the vision we aim for actually is just, it, it was clear that the XAS market, as we call it, has the potential for a EIM system, which is more built around the idea of becoming a platform. So you have great APIs, you can easily integrate it into your existing solutions, and you have already all the features ready, which you need to get your product into the market. So you don't need to, to figure out all those features. So, <clears throat> so 
if I'm talking about features, each and any project today, if you're building a, some kind of so solution, you will end up with those big three topics. Huh? The authentication is, yeah, th that's more or less the most visible part for most of you guys. So you have like 2FA or multi-factor con constructs. You also get passwordless today. It's like there's a thing called the FIDO2. Uh, where you can use your let's uh, let's say the iphone with face id and touch id or you can use your um, yubikey or whatnot to get uh, a passwordless authentication which is more secure in regard to uh, phishing resistance for example yeah? and you will need those in the future on the close future and you will also need a single sign-on with identity providers like external identity providers like google uh, azure ad uh, whatever system your customers have lying around so these are the, the vital topics there for most of any projects today. Then even there, all the projects will have some kind of authorization model to them. It doesn't need to be necessarily role-based, but in the end, you will have the case that you need to assign certain access rights to people and organizations. Oh, let's call these access rights for the moment role-based because it's the most common from a business perspective, not from a technical um, point of view, but from a business point of view. You want to assign roles to people so that they can get access to different resources. And you, get, you, you do this both ways, like you assign roles to users that they can consume data from some service. And you also delegate roles to organizations like companies that they can manage they, their access rights on their own. So I, if I'm chaos, I can, I can delegate um, Balwas some roles and they can um, decide who has access to certain data on their own, right? which is called delegation in the, in, the access, in the access management world. And it's quite important if you think of a SaaS service because you have the service and you populate those roles to different customers and you don't want to manage their role assignments because yeah, that's self-service. Otherwise, SaaS will not work. Uh, it, it won't scale, simply said. So the, the third bullet point there is really important. Self-service in general is kind of the a tricky part because most of the systems today tend to not really support great self-service scenarios. And I will explain in a minute why there are some topics which are really hindering the effort today to get um, a great experience for your customers there. So self-service is everywhere. Otherwise, you can't call it as a service because then it's more managed, from my opinion. So, <clears throat> so let's dive into what generally felt wrong or was missing. Yeah, that's quite a wide area of, of, of things. So we'll, I will kick off things with features. Most of the systems, not to say all of them, but most of the identity systems have absolutely not, not great, no great capabilities in regard to long-term audit trails. And what I mean by that is in a security system, you want to be able to reproduce any state a certain amount of time in the past. Because if you get the security incident, uh, you might detect that six months away from your log storage. So all your log data is already purged, but you still need to make, make, make an, um, a report what happened six months ago. And so we, we thought it is quite important for a modern identity solution to provide an audit trail, which you can reproduce any state of the past. And that's why we went with Citadel for event sourcing and CQRS architecture. So we kind of have all the changes over the, the, the total past of any object. This makes sure that we can really, really build great audit trails on top of the stuff. And also other things which I will mention later. Most of the systems today just emit log files or you can configure um, some events which are then uh, output it in some uh, yeah, CM solution, but that's not exactly easy to handle because you can't really reproduce how the data looked in the system, but you just get an event that something changed. And with it, without the context of the data store, like the IAM itself, it's actually a little bit useless or you need to, to really 
pump a lot of data to that data as well to get some sensible meaning out of it. So it, it just felt wrong. I am absolutely not a fan of the existing solutions there. Then also on the self-service side, um, some of the solutions provide like self-service portals, but most of them who does that are actually focused around end customers. And by end customer, I mean, I mean you, if you purchase privately something uh, from Digitech, yeah, you're an end customer. Most of them have no solution for um, business to business cases. And that's actually quite important because with, uh, yeah, with a growing field of digitalization, oftentimes companies want to manage their users with different providers. So if I am working at Chaos, I want to provide who can access Digitech in the name of Chaos. And I want to do that on my own. And so I need to be able to, to, to manage that data. And if I'm doing that, I maybe also want to uh, reuse my existing uh, identity system. For example, we have like a G Suite, or today it's called Google Workspace, I guess, um, accounts where our people or our employees can access services. And I, as company, won't be able to use my existing identity solution with a service provider and also manage access rights. So the self-service of IDPs or the federation is close to non-existing. And it's, it's from our perspective, a vital um, part to, to get um, more security into the, such into services. Because it, of, most of the times, yeah, it's set up by hand, by uh, email, they, they do something like SAML and yeah, you, you get quite a lot of uh, attack surface there because sometimes private keys are sent over email and all that stuff. So it, yeah, it's not, not really optimal from a security perspective. Then the delegation of access management is all what I already described. Like I want to be able to uh, give another organization the right to manage its roles on their own. No, no existing solution really does that today, uh, except yeah, Azure AD, for example, uh, and of zero and Okta as well. But all of them have the drawback of being a cloud only solution, which is not feasible for each and every part. So that's kind of the, 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 the trick, trick there. Mm -hmm. Existing solutions oftentimes do not have kind of the focus of being a platform, but instead more of being a product. Like you, you can run it, it is out of the box configured in some way, but it does not exactly provide great APIs to change and manipulate data within the system. And we think that's a big enabler because with Citadel, we built everything around APIs. So even our own management GUI, which is called console, is an Angular application, is interfacing with our own APIs. And so we're going for eat your own dog food mentality there. And it really works well because service provider integration parties can build mostly anything on top of the IAM without caring too much about certain security aspects like secure login and all that stuff. Because you, you get that still out of the box. You can use it, but if you don't want to use it yet, then go and build your own thing. So the market is kind of dizzy yeah, because most of the companies are actually US based. And I'm not here to tell you that US is bad, but I'm here to tell you that sometimes it, it, it you have kind of a strange feeling in the market because all the security systems or most of them are controlled by US bodies. And that also has to always has the bad aftertaste of how can they access or manipulate your systems. So it's kind of a risk argument there. It's not like US is bad. Uh, they have really great products. So I absolutely love uh, off zero, by the way. But in the end, it, it has has a bad aftertaste. Hmm? Like for with Keycloak, for example, you don't get any visible control what Red Hat is actually aiming for, but you get an open source product, which is well built. It is good maintained and it is stable and life cycled. So it's kind of a, a, a tricky discussion there, whether it's a great thing or not. But I leave that up to you. From my perspective, it's not a, such a great thing. And also, there is actually, with, with the exception of us, there is no EIM as a service provider which is located in Europe. 
There are only uh, companies who provide managed identity and access management system, but we think it's not the same. So you can call them and they will run an identity solution for you. Yeah, but that's not the same as a, as a service model where the customer can click the thing together and it runs easily. So we, we make a minor distinction there. And for the European market is close to non-existing today, but I think that will shift in the future. That's, that's one of the things we, we thought is a great leverage into that market. So now off to the technology side. The, I, I, it's clerical to write oftentimes state the technology stack, but in the end, oftentimes the things we see is either good old Java, a little bit of Python, sometimes PHP, and a little bit of C sharp in the market. Yeah? Some of them, yeah, are good frameworks, but it always felt quite dated with no clear integration um, points. So it's kind of a two legged problem there due to the fact that the technology stack is quite dated, it is not exactly easy, easy to integrate in modern solutions because it oftentimes do not, does not provide great APIs. Mm. They, they started to provide APIs, but they're oftentimes really bolted on and it feels weird to use them. And that's a thing that we thought we need to, to solve by providing APIs from scratch. And, also more, more more modern apis like grpc because uh, oftentimes you want to have uh, really easily typed interfaces and yeah it, it makes more sense to integrate that because you have really great contracts with grpc for example also most of the times those solutions are, are hard to run and scale so not to tell they can't scale but it is more um error prone to scale such a solution across uh, different zones in the cloud or different data centers because the, the storage layer most of the times will tie you back eventually and also they oftentimes do not possess the abilities for service discovery with kubernetes uh, for example and so you need to really build a lot of tooling around the problems which could be solved easily by relying on something like Kubernetes for, for orchestration jobs. So this comes especially visible when you're talking about how can I split the system across multiple regions and multiple data centers? Because in that case, you will see that most of the data models are not optimized for like eventual consistent uh, systems. And you oftentimes get blocking requests across your own, all your data centers if you do that. So you need to invest a lot of time. And we thought actually this could be solved by relying on uh, simple dogmas. Like yeah, in our case, we, we separate the command side from the query side so we can scale them separately. Uh, then we have an architecture where each Citadel pod on its own can do everything. Most of the times um, it, it will just be run in parallel. Like you can just spawn Citadel pods and also we just can scale the database as well because that's, we, we rely heavily on Cockroach DB there because it scales as well as Citadel. And so we got the elasticity, which we need to, to cover that certain topics. Right? And it, it gives us an operational ease because we don't need to figure all these things out because yeah, Cockroach invested a lot of time to make sure they, that they can run distributed and track transactions and stuff and so we can just rely on their uh, solved problems and this applies for kubernetes as well so we, we're actually tied with them both of them really in a, in a kind of a deep fashion because it, they enable us at certain point in time like maybe in five to ten years they become a liability but right now it's the perfect thing to do so, Pricing was also something special. Uh, you see a lot of security solutions with security features hidden behind the paywall. And that's especially true for cloud solutions like um, Azure AD or especially Okta, uh, <laughs> because they will get, yeah, they charge you like uh, three bucks extra just to get multi-factor authentication uh, to your users. And that's kind of an anti-pattern for security. So if I'm using an identity system, I want to increase security and not increase the security by paying even more 
because in the first place, uh, identity and access management solution should have provided that feature in the base pricing. So we think, find that's a, a strange anti-pattern. And as well, that oftentimes they pay by user or session pricing. And th this also triggers anti-patterns because if your users are need to pay their accounts, in the end, you will end up end with scenarios where a user will share their account eventually. And that's bad for your audit capabilities. Yeah. So we think of uh, just get the price for uh, unlimited users and, and a fair use policy will do more um, positive things than harm. And the pricing model by user will harm your business model and your audit capabilities. So it's kind of harmful to security from our perspective. And also, some of them distinguish between different types of users. Uh, they differentiate employees, customers, partners, machines, whatever. And we find that also strange. I can hear the argument because, yeah, an employee will uh, run like, uh, will log in like daily, and the customer might log just log in once a month. But but still, it, it's not infrastructure cost of an identity solution is neglectable in, in regards to the workforce cost you have. So it, it's not exactly a great model to, to, to build it around that. So, and last but not least, <laughs> the regulatory problems. You, you get a lot of them actually, like GDPR is a hellhole. Uh, if you're serving customers in Europe, yeah, you, you will have a bad time with GDPR. And that's something a system needs to be needs to address as well. And the American companies started recently addressing these problems, but still they remain. Also, the, the topics of broken privacy shield and safe harbor is kind of a problem because, yeah, by actual regulation, uh, US is not a, a safe country in regard to personal uh, personal data processing. So you need to um, manage those risks as well. Mm -hmm. And also, if you go for a cloud service, you have the, the issue of own your data. Like, is the data portable enough? Can I get my data out of it and can I run it elsewhere? And it, that's tricky to achieve, I must say. But in the end, um, we think of that like, yeah, okay, you can, for example, use our cloud service. And at a certain point in time, you might um, decide to run your own system or let us run a citadel for you and we you, we can then port the data wherever you like to have them so you can even run them in your private data center and it gives you quite a lot of flexibility to address regulatory risks at that point so yeah so that's the hard part now go to the more interesting part huh? what functions each project need will, uh, sooner or later yeah single sign on i guess you heard that Secure authentication, you, you will need that. Identity brokering, you will need that as well. I will explain in a second why. Right? Identity management, yeah, that a company can manage its users, access management, that you can access, uh, can manage access rights, and also APIs to integrate the system into projects. So such, these are the base requirements for such a system. So let's talk about challenges then. The One of the, yeah, challenges we see is identity brokering with self-service. And that's what I talked initially about. Yeah, let's company manage their single sign on, on their own. So that's kind of a two-legged challenge. Huh? We have on the left side, for example, yeah, that's just as, as an example, we have Apple and Apple ID, and the SaaS providers in the middle might want to reuse consumer accounts with like let's call it Apple ID or Google or whatnot. So they can figure to um, uh, set up like the, the trust line here, mm. like uh, um, a company can set up Citadel to trust Apple ID and then they can use Apple ID for their customers. So, but on the enterprise side of things, it's a little different. Huh? There you have kind of the B2B, B2B problem. So the administrator of that said company defines which identity system might be in the background or sometimes they don't provide you one at all. So they want to manage the users with your system. And so we built Citadel around the idea that each company can manage on their own, if they choose to, they can manage on their own, their identity providers. This actually shifts quite a lot of work away 
from your support front because they don't need to uh, mingle with all that stuff and you can delegate it to the customer and reduce your uh, support upcoming as uh, support um, uh, times. So that's kind of the idea behind it. So, <clears throat> and actually that's not really existing in the market. Like you have single sign on with federation is yeah most of the systems so they can do that without any major problems but being able to do it on your own for business customers is not really the thing right now but it should be from our perspective and also this will be a challenge for the future in regard to um, the topic of self-sovereign identities because if you think like each user has a different identity system to it yeah you need to figure out how he can manage its linked identities in your in your system so in that case, each user on their own must be able to manage its external identities as well. Just think of the uh, EID discussion in Switzerland or in, in, in Europe, it's like the AIDAS regulation. So people have identities and they want to use them with you, but it's not exactly one identity, but instead a, a whole bunch of. Yeah. So the user needs to be able to manage that. And that's kind of an important thing in the future. So second challenge, I also briefly talked about it, is the delegation of roles. And the, the, the big difference we make here, if you compare it to a key cloak, is like an organization would be more or less um, a realm in key cloak. So we have kind of Citadel as system and in Citadel you have organization, each is um, uh, more or less represents um, like an, an OU in, in an LDAP or, or if you talk about Azure AD, it's a tenant. So it, it represents a certain boundary. And within an organization, you get your users, you get your authorizations, you get your projects. And the project is basically a, a thing where you manage all the things containing um, uh, for, for, uh, from an application, from a bundle of applications. So, for example, if you were Google, Google Drive would be a project. So you would have an organization Google and you would have an, a project called Google Drive. And within that Google Drive project, you would have all your roles like user, administrator and all that stuff. And also all your, all your applications like, yeah, you have a web client, you have a mobile client, you have a desktop client, eh? and they all share their, their, the same role catalog to them. And that's what we call a project. So it's kind of the security context you have. And then the special thing is if you're in the service provider business, eh, you might be Google here and you want to delegate the role user for Google Drive to another company so that they can manage on its own which user does have the role user with them. Eh? So we call that organization grant. And the idea behind is that the service provider is always in the driver's seat who can do what with that data. So as company, I really want to have control whether my customer can uh, change access rights on their own or that they don't. So for, for example, if they don't pay, yeah, yeah, I might want to re revoke their access. And so it's kind of a natural behavior and each SaaS model builds that and we, we find the harmonization within one common data model is uh, more easy to get the hold on for um, potential implementation parties so <clears throat> it's kind of a key feature yeah, for SaaS providers um, because yeah you, you don't need to mingle around that data model it's really hard uh, especially if it needs to scale like one to n uh, you, you get a lot of customers at some point and you don't want to uh, loosely couple that you want really to couple that hard so Challenge number three, <laughs> I also briefly introduced the problem with the audit trail and oftentimes with security breaches, it's, it's really the problem of what happens a long time ago and you will end up with a bad time if you don't have, get that data. So, and we think of that like, okay, we, we have, we call it time travel. Uh, it, it sounds a bit, a bit 
blown off the water but in the end it's just a feature where you can say hey i want to show how does that user look at like six months ago and what then changed eventually like who changed for example the access rights and with, with event sourcing we can really do that because we can just create a let's call it projection. That's kind of the object, how it's called in, in event sourcing. We can just make a projection how the user looked at that point in time. And so you can easily travel forward and backwards in your, in, in your event stream, and you can build great audit um, trails out of that because we have the, all, all the necessary data over a long time. And we think of like, plus 12 months should be the, the thing to aim at because most of the times you get audited all, all each 12 months and you want to be able to get certain data out of it over that set period. Mm -hmm. well, some people say to me, okay, we can just build an audit database to the, the, the identity system or you, we can emit log files to other systems. And I'm going to tell you, well, yeah, that would work in theory, but if you have an external database, you will end up with data inconsistencies and a lot of uh, misused storage because you need a lot of storage to just hold those projections, which is not a great thing to duplicate the data around. And on the other hand, um, if you try to, if you go the way of emitting log files, yeah, you will have the problem of context. You just get the events, but not the context to the data. And so you need to figure out all the, the, the necessary details. And oftentimes those log files change over time and you will have a bad time parsing the data set and building meaningful um, uh, states out of it. Mm -hmm. That's how we think about that topic. And uh, funny side note, or for us, actually one of the in interesting, interesting, most interesting features for the future is, as we have those data a long time back, we can build um, threat intelligence reports out of that. Also, I mean, threat intelligence model in a, in a meaningful way, like with machine learning and deep learning, you can analyze, uh, analyze the behavior of your users and you can then specifically make threat models for the data you have and not the data somebody else provided. And so the system itself can really be improved and hardened over time because we have all the data from the past to to get new models and to train them and to improve the security as well and one thing i like to to mention here especially is you can also prevent things like privilege escalations with that so because we could say it's not normal that somebody like an administrator gives another another person administrative rights. So it's, it seems like fraudulent and you could then prompt the user to confirm for um, like to re-authenticate or something like that to prevent privilege escalation attacks. And this just by using the historical data from the system, because you can, you can get out the great probability if this makes sense or not. So, and also you get business reports like historical data use. Yeah, you can build beautiful charts if you go for that. We don't provide a proper API for that topic yet, but it's one of the things we aim to mostly in the future because you can build great dashboards. You can see which application has the most users and all of that without any big problems because you will get all the necessary data from the past. So. Just to talk some influential things here, Cloudflare has had influenced our vision around the pricing, like a tiered pricing and not a by user pricing. And GitLab influenced us by the, the, the meaning of, yeah, they run a cloud service, but you can use their product on premise or in your own data center as well. And Cockroach has kind of the same vision that you can use their product anywhere uh, in the cloud on prem and they, they don't hinder the usage in any way, except they have some enterprise features, which you need to pay for. And we also have something like that, like add-ons, which most of the people want and use anyway. So it's kind of enterprise features are a little bit hidden, but some cases will need them that influenced us really. So 
I will rush th through those because it's not the essence of the talk I wanted to give you. So the vision for Project Citadel is actually uh, security is included, no, no extra add-on to pay for. The audit trail is built into the data model. We make no difference in account times. It has a cloud-native architecture. I will see in a minute what I mean by that. We optimized it for day two operation scalability. Multi-region is easily possible. And we provide APIs and it's open source with Apache 2. So it's kind of modern, I would say, from that aspect. Yeah, that's just to sum up. Right? The build for analytics with time tremble is what I meant. Uh, it's an interesting feature and you will see and hear from us with that feature. I, I, I am quite certain of that. So architecture and technologies, yeah, we rely on Golang, Angular, Cockroach, and Mini.io, and uh, as well, Kubernetes. And yeah, the system is scalable from one data center to n data centers. I just make, may, need to make sure that you have an, an odd number because of the quorum concept behind. The API first, uh, everything, also mostly everything has an API to it. It runs basically on any CNCF compliant Kubernetes. And we even provide you with an operator to get up and running. And it manages the database as well. So you don't need to run the database on your own. You just can install the operator and it will make sure that the database is able available, it, that you have the certificates for the database, like with MTLS connections and all that. Um, because we have written it in Go, yeah, it has quite a uh, low footprint. Uh, under normal conditions, we talk about a half gig of memory uh, for as a running Citadel pod, which is serving traffic. And um, this includes already uh, the, the caching of the solution. So if you would run it out of the box, you will end up with like 50 to 60 max per RAM, but it's not a real, real world number. Uh. Then we, we, as I said, we, we use event sourcing so, and uh, we just append all the logs into the database and generate uh, our read models out of that. Mm. Yeah. We have even um, like uh, on our documentation page, there is more detail how the thing really works, but uh, from the top, it looks basically like this with a GUI, with a, a server, like the database and like the asset storage, which is just landing right now for uh, that you can use your own images you can use your own logos you can use user avatars and all that stuff and we needed to store the, the assets and minio is the just the newest addition to the architecture we chose hmm. yeah I, I mean this is more or less a little bit of a sales job there but in the end uh, we have an open source part hmm. and you really can use the product on its own in open source mode you, you get open id connect you get the fancy features uh, just go ahead and use it and uh, write github discussions we actually love to discuss with people and you can use it as product like you can run it in your own data center with a flat fee pricing from us and support and we also provide a SaaS service uh, for for projects who don't want to have the operational burden and the better pricing point than the product part of it so it's kind of the holy grail eh? you can do each three of them of them scenarios and the uh, i would say most of the people will run it in open source mode eventually and uh, what we're doing right now is community building eh? because that's kind of the, the the most established open source community is, is key cloak in that regard and we oftentimes see people fed up with key cloak and they will land eventually with us and which gives us a great, great leverage for the future so well, what else? I mean, I will rush to, through those because I, I guess questions are more interesting. I, I explained those these already, so I'll skip them. Um, a word to features, yeah, we, we get you get passwordless with us, you get OpenID Connect, 2FA, FIDO, Federation, single sign on, the whole bunch. You get role based access control, the delegation part, you get a lot of self service features. And you even get some policies like uh, on the IAM administration corner. Huh? You can set policies like password strength. You can white label, or today let's call it private labeling, not white labeling anymore. Um, you can like uh, design your own emails and stuff. And what we provide as well are those so called uh, extensions, which are not yet open source because. These are uh, kind of enterprise extensions where you need to pay us some money. 
and it's kind of a business enabler for us because the most of the protocols here are not so vital for most of the projects yeah there are even nifty details but if you want to have details yeah just go ahead and ask me afterwards yeah you can use opaque tokens you could use jot tokens and all that stuff so yeah i guess it's it's more interesting to to talk about that later on so in most scenarios you will end up with something like that huh? as said citadel is a platform it's not a I can do everything identity and access management solution. It has no workflow components to it. So Citadel cannot do business processes for you, but we instead integrate with different tools for that job. So if you figure a classic uh, company, you could have your SAP, which has a HR suit, so like the human resources management, and that could interface with Citadel for uh, managing and creating the users. You could build like the process, whether a user get, gets access to something, you could do that in like, for example, in ServiceNow and integrate it on top of the API. So you can do things like uh, for, our, for ICE processes and all that stuff. You can even emit our data into external systems for log analysis if you, if you uh, care. And also we integrate with uh, proxy products like OAuth proxy, ambassador. You can basically choose any a reverse proxy that uh, supports our protocols. And for those who care, we provide our boss to run it in a kind of self-managed infrastructure way. So you get Citadel out of the box running on servers without you needing to do any by hand operations. But still, you can use uh, good old Kubernetes without us to run the system on top. And our boss is also open source for, for those who care. Right? Feel free to engage with us there. We actually, it's more of a behind the scenes product, but it's really vital for us. So you can figure each cluster we run runs on top of our boss and, and it, it really enables our velocity because we can uh, like run the Citadel cluster, for example, with Google in like 18 minutes and everything is set up straight, like the VM, Kubernetes, and all that stuff. So it's a great enable for us. That's why we actually built it. So to check out things and things, we have some links here. Um, we provide some libraries on our own, like a Dart library. We have a company we work for with, which provided the .NET library. And so, yeah, there are quite a lot of things evolving right now. And uh, feel free and check out our documentation page. It has also a great search. Just try it and use it. Otherwise, yeah, feel free and go ahead with questions. Uh, I am totally open for any kind of questions and criticism. <laughs>